I wanted to do something special for all those DILFs out there this Father's Day and talk about not only the best Father's Day movie, but also the best Indiana Jones movie in the trilogy. Of course, I'm talking about The Last Crusade. Yeah. You heard that right, the best. It's by the smallest of fractions, but it's got the edge. And when you're edging, you're playing a dangerous game of getting to that point of no return, which is where I'm at right now at this moment, so come with me. I'm as human as the next man. I was the next man. I mean, hell, it was this close to being a Raiders vs. Last Crusade video where I convince all you negative Nancy naysayers that I'm right. Other ideas I was settling on was how every person wearing a flower lapel wanted to kill Indian Henry Jones. How the saw blade booby traps Indy Jones triggers at the end of the movie were intended for both non-believers as well as Muslims. Or maybe I was going to talk about how the Grail Knight maybe never existed in the first place, or how this guy, for all intents and purposes, is Indian mentor and Miriam Ravenwood's father Abner. You know what, before we get started let me know if one of these topics pops a brain boner for you down below in the comments and we'll make it happen. But for right now I just wanted to focus on the story behind the development of Indiana Jones 3 and how Poppy Henry Jones was never even a part of their early concepts and practically an afterthought. There were actually two screenplays written, if not more, before we all got based and Christ pilled with Henry Jones Sr. The first was written by Diane Thomas, who previously wrote Romancing the Stone. See, both Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Romancing the Stone came out in 1984. Even though it was a commercial success, Temple of Doom got mixed reactions from critics. Some of them even went as far as to say Romancing the Stone was the true sequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Which, come on, that's not fair. Romancing the Stone is good, don't get me wrong, but it's no Temple of Doom. The only real issue I have with it is Willie Scott Scott's dialogue. The biggest trouble with her is the noise. Anyways, apparently saying Romancing the Stone was the true sequel to Indiana Jones made George Lucas and Steven Spielberg's eyes pee pee really hard, so they hired the very same screenwriter that made them weepy messes. Couple that with the fact that Ghostbusters spanked their little butts at the box office. I blame myself. So do I. George Lucas wrote a treatment and handed the tear-stained papers to Thomas. He was sobbing when he begged her to flesh it out. She felt bad for him, so she took the job. No joke, his treatment was set in a 1930s haunted house. She immediately recognized the massive cope George was going through. He demanded she make Indiana Jones the original Ghostbuster, busting ghosts with his whip and shooting Slimer with a 38. Indy was also going to fall in love with a writer who understood the house through her research. Turned out later that she was a ghost the whole time. It was a one-way ticket to Easyville. Diane Thomas just copy and pasted Ghostbusters and Romancing the Stone scripts and just shuffled some pages around. When George Lucas got her script back, he thought he had a surefire hit. This will shut up the stupid critics. This is the true sequel to Indiana Jones and a prequel to Ghostbusters. I rule. Thomas was like, sure you do, dude. Can you cut me a check now? Shortly after she turned in the screenplay, Diane Thomas was killed in a car accident when her drunk boyfriend wrapped her Porsche around a telephone pole, doing 80 down PCH. The perpetual misfortune magnet continued to be passed around when Lucas handed the screenplay to Spielberg, who was like, dude, what the hell? This is just like Poltergeist. You know, the movie I'm secretly directing, but Universal can't know about because it is a breach of contract? I can't do this. Lucas got salty again. But Stevie, he's a Ghostbuster now. I'm going to bust your ass if you don't throw this away. Lucas didn't want a busted ass, so he went back to the drawing board. This time he hired screenwriter and famed discoverer of America, Chris Columbus, to do the job. He gave Columbus an 11-page treatment that opened with Indy battling a ghost in Scotland. The ghost's name was, of course, Baron Seamus Seagrove III. Man, he was really salty about Ghostbusters beating Temple of Doom at the box office, wasn't he? We came, we saw, we kicked its ass! Chris Columbus took his little goony fingers and began to clack away at the keyboard, writing non-stop for at least two hours at a time before having a snack. He'd snort a little white Cheeto dust off his fingers before he would start again for another two hours. The screenplay he turned in landed somewhere between a Cheeto-induced fever dream in the wild, wild west. It was titled Indiana Jones and the Monkey King. The Garden of Immortal Peaches was the main plot device. It started in 1937 with 
indie vacationing in Scotland, naturally. This is where he fights the ghost of Baron Seamus Seagrove III, of course. Indy then travels to Mozambique to aid Dr. Claire Clark, a Catherine Hepburn type according to George Lucas, who has found a 200-year-old pygmy named Taiki Taiki. This little guy possesses directions to the lost city of the Monkey King, Sun Wukong. Sun Wukong? Sun will come is more like it. It only makes sense that a pygmy in Africa has directions that lead to immortal life in China. Anyways, the Monkey King's Orchard reportedly grows peaches that grant eternal life. You know who else is looking for these peaches? Failed Austrian painter army guys who are led by this massive muscle daddy called Lieutenant Werner von Mephistos. I'm automatically going to cast Dolph Lundgren as Lieutenant Werner von Mephistos. He fits the part. As Indy is headed upriver to China, Taiki is captured by a subordinate of Dolph Mephisto's named Helmut Gutterberg, who has a machine gun for an arm and escapes in a three-story tall tank. Chris took another Cheeto break before writing all that. Indy, Claire, and some guy named Scraggy Briar, a native friend of Indiana Jones, travels up the Zambezi River to rescue Taiki. When they reach the gates of the lost city of the Monkey King, they are defended by gorillas. But Taiki is able to calm them down before any real damage is done. A large battle ensues between Indy and the gorillas versus the Stash King's army guys, including Daddy Dolph Mephistos and Hell Arm Gunberg with his three-story tank. During the battle, the gorillas commandeer the tank. Stop. Does any of this sound familiar yet? Indiana Jones attacks Mustache Daddy's bad boys on the back of a rhinoceros. Dolph Mephistos is knocked into a tiger pit and mauled to death. Indiana Jones is shot dead only to be revived by the Monkey King through a piece of fruit from his garden. Seriously, none of this is ringing a bell. Other characters included an African tribe of cannibals, Betsy, a stowaway student who is willing to use the self-checkout lane because she is so in love with Dr. Jones, and I mean, who isn't? And lastly, a band of pirates led by a Toshiro Mufuni type who ends up pushing daisies because he ate a peach while not being pure of heart. Also, there is a scene where Indiana Jones is forced to play chess with people as pieces. Each piece that is captured, the person is disintegrated. I don't know about you, but this whole story sounds so batshit crazy that I would watch the hell out of it. Listen, this is the type of story that could make the Godfather look like Ishtar. It is so off the wall that it could be either one of the worst movies to ever be released, which is entertaining in itself, or it would have been one of the greatest, but we'll never know. Spielberg took a look at this script and told Lucas, listen dude, you just dropped Howard the Duck. So how about you cut the shit and make a movie about Indiana Jones and his dad where they both chase after the Holy Grail? At first, Lucas scoffed at the idea before he gave in and said, all right, we'll make the Grail the main focus. Spielberg pinched his nose like he had a headache and shook his head. No, you absolute obliviate. We make the father-son relationship the central theme. The Grail is a metaphor for Indiana Jones and his father. George was beside himself. How did he not see this as a possibility? We don't even need ghosts. The story just writes itself. We probably still need a screenwriter though, huh? Oy vey, dude, Spielberg said. I'm gonna go direct Empire of the Sun. Please get Jeff Bohm to write this. Don't do it yourself, Captain EO. Lucas did get Bohm, and they closely worked on a treatment that, outside of a few minor details, resembles the movie we have today. It was Bohm's idea that Indy should find his father in the middle of the film, and the movie itself shouldn't end with them obtaining the grail, but rather losing it, letting the father-son relationship be the main point. Most of Henry's comedic moments were added much later when Sean Bon Connery suggested them. And there it is, the birth of the greatest father-son movie and Indiana Jones movie ever made. It's an archaeological search for a son's own identity, and coming to accept his father is more what it's about than the quest to find the grail itself. It is a movie that has mimicked the relationship of fathers and sons, including my own, for over 30 years, and for many decades to come. And it almost didn't happen at all. Happy Father's Day, you damn dilfs. If you enjoyed this video, you go ahead and smash that like button. While you're done doing that, hit the subscribe button. And then, after that, share this with your friends, family, pe people you hate. Maybe you don't like my content and just want to waste somebody's time. Do it. Share it. Thank you.
It is much appreciated. I'm out of here.